Welcome to the 129th annual meeting of the trustees and our first virtual. Admittedly, when I joined the organization nine years ago, I didn't imagine we would be conducting business this way. Yet it affords a great opportunity to see our trustees' beautiful platforms. Still, it's not the same as coming together and know that even as we celebrate tonight's accomplishments, we miss you all. You may have heard of late that I've undergone some health challenges, so you'll be hearing less from me this evening and more from a variety of other stakeholders. I want to specifically thank Peter Coffin, our trustees board chair, and Jocelyn Forbush, our executive vice president, who will be doing much of the reporting against our 2020 objectives. Now, trustees has been around a long time. We've been an organization of endurance, of taking the long view. We persevere. But even now we are tested in this time of pandemic, of economic uncertainty, of cultural shifts. But our mission has never been more relevant for people. People seek a return to normalcy and they get that in our mission, in our places, in our work. So as we begin to wrap up 2020, know how grateful I am for your enduring support, how excited I am to have your participation in our mission, and how much I know we're gonna to continue to do together in the months and years ahead. Thank you and welcome again. Good evening. It's my honor to welcome you all to the 129th Annual Meeting of the Trustees of Reservations. As you can see, I'm at the stunning Crane Estate in Ipswich. I wish you were here. Just as I would if we were all together, I will share with you the many accomplishments and challenges of the organization from the past year and the stories of some of the extraordinary people who have moved our mission forward with exuberance. These are unprecedented times. Even in the midst of a public health and financial crisis, we maintain this important tradition of holding this meeting as it has been consecutively held for nearly 130 years. The tradition endures and so do our spirits. Thank you for spending the evening with us and I hope you enjoy our presentations. Like every other organization and business, this year has been a challenging one for the trustees, but I'm happy to report that we are still moving forward still finding ways to get people outside and engaged with culture and the arts, and we are still providing much needed exercise and solace for our members and visitors at our special places. We are a strong organization making plans for a bright future. Now, let's get to business. To get started, you'll hear from Buzz Constable, the Secretary of the Board of Directors, who will outline the proxy votes for tonight's meeting and from Nisi Panetta, Vice Chair of the Trustees Board of Directors, who will share the new nominations to governance. Good evening. My name is Buzz Constable, and it's my honor to serve as Secretary of the Trustees. This is an unusual year for many reasons, but we have much to celebrate at the Trustees, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to come together. Earlier this morning, on November 5, 2020, the voting members of the trustees convened for the official 129th annual meeting. Peter Coffin, Board of Directors Chair, called the meeting to order. As secretary, I then declared a quorum and called for a motion to waive the reading of the meeting minutes of the 2019 annual meeting, as well as approve the 2020 Treasurer's Report and the 2020 Governance Slate as presented uh, by email and U.S. Postal Service. Upon motion duly made and seconded, it was unanimously voted to approve, first, the meeting minutes of the 2019 annual meeting held on November 7, 2019 at the State Room in Boston, second, the 2020 Treasurer's Report, third, the 2020 Governance Slate, including nominees uh, for and renominees for the Board of Directors, the Advisory Board, Chairman's Council, Corporate Trustee, and Life Trustee. I'd like to extend my personal gratitude to all of you for your continued leadership and support of the trustees. The commitment of our governance members has long been the foundation of our organization, and it is in large part thanks to you that we are able to weather this challenging time. Personally, I look forward to seeing many of you on our reservations and at future meetings. 
Good evening. I'm David Kroll, Chair of the Finance and Audit Committee at the Trustees. I'm going to report on this year's financial performance and the five-year look. Fiscal year 2020 was a year of great progress in the second year of achieving the goals of the Trustees' strategic plan, which we call Momentum. Based on this very strong growth, balanced by fiscal conservatism. Effective management and enthusiastic support by members and donors enabled the trustees to avoid cash deficits and to grow revenues by 50% over the past five years with total assets now exceeding 300 million. This approach has positioned us to be in much better financial position than many organizations our peers to withstand the impacts of COVID-19, thus far avoiding both large layoffs and significant deficits. Last year's main accomplishments include the full integration of the Decordova Sculpture Park and Museum, the largest ever merger in the trustees' history. Visitation overall continued to grow and exceeded for the first time two million visitors an increase of 75% over the last five years. Membership also enjoyed another strong year, rising to over 155,000 households with 7% growth year over year. All categories of earned income increased, including admissions, tours, CSAs, public programming, and summer camps. So we're hitting essentially on all cylinders. Our new Winter Lights program has also grown revenue and participation with almost 60,000 new visitors last year. Fundraising contributed over 22 million and was very efficiently raised. So now fundraising and administrative costs are less than 20%, meaning that over 80% goes to direct delivery of our mission of conservation, environmental sustainability, cultural preservation, and healthy local agriculture. The Trustees is a healthy, growing organization with a mission that is increasingly appealing to the public. During COVID-19, many people were reminded of how much they appreciate what we have to offer. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Nisi Panetta, Vice Chair of the Board of Directors. We're truly fortunate and so grateful to have so many exceptional governance volunteers who support the organization with their time, talent, and energy, especially at this time of challenge. On behalf of the governance and nominating committees, I'm pleased to share with you the exceptional governance leaders joining us in this important work in 2020. Nominations were shared with all voting members of the trustees and confirmed by vote at our meeting this morning. Each year, members of the governance and nominating committees devote time and care to identifying and recruiting leaders who bring needed expertise, wise judgment, and deep commitment to nominate for leadership roles. These committees also spend time with current governance members who are up for renomination. We're very proud of the excellent slate we have before you. For the Board of Directors, we have three new nominations, each serving one three-year term. Niti Bala Johnson, Boston, Julia Kraft, Westport, Scott Uzel, Boston. For the advisory board, we have five new nominations, each serving one three-year term. Debbie Barker, Boston, Fred Kaduri, Chilmark, Drew McMorrow, Carlisle, Gerald Orastaglio, Boston, Dick Taggart, Rockport. For Chairman's Council, we have six new nominations each serving one three-year term. Clem Benenson, South Hamilton, Marjorie Greville, Boston, Doug Harding, Lincoln, Ted Landsmark, Jamaica Plain, Brian Monick, Hingham, Hugh Morton, Westport. For corporate trustees, we have 26 new nominations, each serving one three-year term. Debbie Barker, Boston, Eli Kasdan, New York, New York, John Collins, South Hamilton, Natalie de Normandy, Boston, Deirdre Dow Chase, Largo, Florida, Janet Foley, North Andover, Chris Ford, South Hamilton, Kelly Guarino, Boston, Tom Hayes, Alton, New Hampshire, 
Jamie Hunt, Lincoln, Raina Lesser Hannaway, Prize Crossing, Kathleen O'Hara, Concord, Matthew O'Toole, Weston, Gerald Oristaglio, Boston, Melanie Park, Cambridge, Jeff Potter, Weston, Peggy Reiser, Brookline, Dick Taggart, Rockport, Caroline Tall, Boston, Carol Tully, Boston, Alyssa Warner, Cambridge, Stephen Webb, Boston, Keith Wenzel, North Andover, Lynn Wenzel, North Andover, Frederick Winthrop III, Ipswich, and Mandy Young, Concord. You will also find a listing of the members of governance who have been renominated for terms of three years in the program book. Participants were offered the opportunity to put forth nominations from the floor during our meeting this morning, and none were suggested. Upon a motion made and duly seconded, the slate was approved by unanimous vote. Congratulations to all who've been elected. I thank you all for your service and look forward to working with you over the coming years. This year, we have two members of our board who are retiring, Clem Benenson and Hugh Morton. They have both been valued members of governance and we will miss their presence and counsel. And we are honored that Hugh Morton has agreed to become a life trustee. I'm David Kroll, a member of the Board of Directors of the Trustees, and it is my distinct pleasure to announce and welcome Hugh Morton as a life trustee. A life trustee isn't elected every year because it's an honor reserved for extraordinary people. And Hugh Morton is one of those people. Hugh joined the Board of the Trustees in 2011, and he was involved with us long before then as a member of our advisory committee and as a 30-year member of the organization. Without Hugh's dedication to conservation, the south coast of Massachusetts might look very differently today. He worked tirelessly to protect 2,000 acres of land in Westport, including our lovely Westport Town Farm. Hugh was also a driving force behind the trustees acquiring the Haskell Public Gardens in New Bedford and creating new important relationships in that geographic area that have had a lasting positive impact. When people think of the trustees, they don't necessarily think technology. But as a member of our Finance and Audit Committee, Hugh understood the needs of a growing organization that must have the capabilities in the digital age to be successful. Through the Manton Foundation, which he and his family run, Hugh invested in a transformation of our technology infrastructure, which allows us to reach and serve more people, our mission. He was also a board member for many other worthwhile organizations, including the South Coast Health Systems and the National Sclerosis Foundation. And he's a finance committee member for the town of Westport, where I'm told he is regarded as a pillar of the community. When people enjoy the expansive view of the river from the Westport Town Farm, or enjoy a stroll through the historic gardens at the Haskell Public Gardens, or take a hike up Pegan Hill for a sunset, or admire the artwork at the decor of a sculpture park and museum. They are experiencing just a small part of the legacy that Hugh Morton has created during his tenure with the trustees. We have been very fortunate to have his time, investment, and expertise for the last three decades, for which we are very grateful. Hugh, I have enjoyed working with you and have appreciated your steady guidance on many occasions, and I look forward to continued partnerships and further accomplishments in the years to come. Hugh, congratulations on becoming a life trustee. Hello, I'm Andrew Davis, a member of the Trustees Board of Directors. It is my pleasure to recognize and thank Clem Benenson for his years of service to the trustees upon his retirement from the board. Clem is a champion of land conservation with a passion for preserving and protecting our special places and ensuring we have a solid foundation to build the trustees of the future. 
He was appointed to the board in recognition of this commitment. As a three-year chair of the nominating committee, Clem focused on the sustainability of the organization for future generations, connecting us to new leaders with broad expertise and key networks. Clem has also been an unwavering voice on the board, reminding us that as we strive to do many new and exciting things, we must always remain true to our core mission to protect special places for everyone, forever. During his tenure on the board, Clem also served as an active member of our development, stewardship, and strategic enterprise committees during a period of major growth for the organization, providing strategic insight and a steady commitment and stepping on to the North Shore Advisory Group at a critical time. We must also acknowledge the incredible leadership that Clem and his wife, Steph, have shown in building and supporting our Art in the Landscape initiative. Thanks to their partnership, we have welcomed new audiences to experience the trustees' properties through memorable contemporary art installations. Anyone who knows Clem knows that he and Steph are the life of any party. We were lucky to have them as co-chairs of the enormously successful 125th Gala at Appleton Farms. More recently, we served together on the leadership committee for the Snowball at the Crane Estate. With the Benenson support, this event was a major success in its first year and will undoubtedly become a signature trustees event on the North Shore. Thank you, Clem, for your leadership, wise counsel, and friendship. You may be retiring from the board, but we know you will continue to be a champion of the trustees art and landscape project, a force to be reckoned with at special events, and a continued conservation leader on the North Shore. For that, we thank you. Thank you, David and Andrew. Each year, the trustees honors and celebrates some extraordinary individuals or groups who we feel deserve to be recognized for more than just doing the status quo. They stretch beyond goals and go the extra mile to achieve success. We will now honor our Employee of the Year, Javon Mansfield, who works in our Signature Events Department, and our Volunteers of the Year, the Friends of Mary Cummings Park. My name is Javon Mansfield and I'm the Associate Director of Events in the Development Department. I am both honored and humbled being named Employee of the Year. Because of the nature of my job, I am able to interact with so many amazing colleagues. To know how amazing they all are and to be singled out makes this award just beyond special to me. I am fortunate because I feel valued and supported by my peers every day. I work with my supervisor, Michael Rodriguez, to plan and execute governance, fundraising, and signature events across the state, greeting you at events like the Waterfront Gala, Winter Lights, or a Chairman's Council and Sempervirence Society meeting. My job is amazing because it is never dull. During the course of a year, I can plan events located from Cascada Catu to Crane Estate in Namkeg. Whether it's a gala or a small luncheon, the purpose is to celebrate our special places, connect those places to our members and beyond, and provide engaging experiences for the next generation. Last year, I followed the New Horizon hot air balloon around for two straight weeks of events. My first year, we greeted guests off a train at Appleton Farms for the 125th celebrations. And I also have the honor to help arrange this annual meeting and dinner every year. The variety of what I handle on any given day or year is what I love about my job. My favorite event was the World's End 50th anniversary celebration in 2018. We celebrated that night quite literally under the stars at the top of Planters Hill with clear views of Boston. The food, the scenery, the place settings, speeches, music, it was all amazing. With events, there is always something that goes wrong, no matter how hard we plan. But this particular event checked many boxes. And then what made it even better was a rainstorm quite literally ripped down a shade sail as the last shuttle was pulling away. Quite the planning that day. Before I started at the Trustees, I actually worked at De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum as the head of special events and rentals. And I worked here for seven years. De Cordova was able to provide me with a wonderful events background that I'm now able to apply to events for individuals with a vested interest in an organization like the trustees. So to be back at De Cordova to film an Employee of the Year video 
for the annual meeting for the trustees is something that I just never would have thought possible. Needless to say, 2020 for the events world has been challenging. What this year has taken away for celebrations has reminded me and instilled in me the love for what I do and have done here at the trustees during my five years. And we're just celebrating in different ways this year. I am grateful that even today, we can all still connect in some form to be reminded about the amazing work the trustees does, regardless of the pandemic. I usually hover under the large stairwell in the stateroom to monitor everything during the annual meeting, but I guess today I have to get out into the light. And although I can't get you all into the same room this year, I look forward to getting back to my stairwell in 2021. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for this award and recognition. What do I love about Mary Cummings Park? The whole reason for initially moving here, it's openness, it's trees, it's habitat. You know, it's a beautiful place. It's unusual because it has all kinds of fields, streams, brooks. I can come up here and walk in the fields and walk in the swamps like I did as a little boy. So for me, it kind of fulfills that childhood dream. My name is John Sachs. I am a board member of the Friends of Mary Cummings Park for over 10 years. My name is Ed Laturco. Past three years I've been on the board of the Friends. I'm Kath Moore and I have been one of the founders of the Friends of Mary Cummings Park. Well, you're most likely to find me in the meadow here because of its variety of wildlife and plants. Yeah, it's, it's really an escape. There's a lot of things I love about this park. The fact that there are three big ecosystems, you can go out in the open fields of wildflowers, you can go in the deep forest, and then we have that wonderful wetland. The boardwalk is magical. The first time I went out there, I saw a muskrat swim across the channel. And that's something that you'd never get to see without the boardwalk. So the boardwalk allows you to get out and experience that wetland any time of year completely safely. There are so many reasons that I think the park is precious. For one, there's very little open space in this very congested part of the state. Burlington has had a very difficult time trying to maintain openness. There's very little left. There's no question that particularly the three original founders, Steve Kelly, Pat Riley, and Kath Moore, the very hard work that they did saved this park from almost certain development. What we're looking at right now would have been hundreds of houses, a shopping center. It would have been gone. It was very important for me to save this park. Interested in history and being a librarian by trade, it was a natural for me to do the research. It's a huge piece of property, and when I investigated, I found that it was the 12th largest property in, within 128. I worked for News Edge down the street, and I had driven by all the time, past this place. Somebody had posted a handwritten sign saying, if uh, you want to save this place, call me. It's going to be sold. It turned out that it was Pat O'Reilly, and I called him, and that's what got me started with the two of us. So I think that the founders saved it. I came along in a later generation and tried to sustain that. One of the big problems was that the park was completely unknown. You could drive right by here and nobody knew about it. And so we worked very hard to publicize it. And what we said is, let's fix the trails up, let's put signs up, let's build a website, let's participate in Burlington activities like the 4th of July parade and get the park to be better known. The trails access was not there. My counterpart, John Sachs, would give him a lot of credit for doing what he's done to actually put some signage up to tell people, go here, go there. It's got a destined path that connects to other paths and so on. 
almost like a bunch of octopus arms. You know you're gonna to want to see them all. Ed Leturka was very instrumental in moving the process along with the city, getting local politicians involved. My whole background is dealing with our representatives and our senators. The friend said, we'd like to see you as part of this board because you have some connections we don't have. We work really out of love for the park, for the open space, and so to get recognized for it, it's a good feeling. For me, it's very personal. If I am a member of the trustees, I bring my family to a number of parks. We couldn't be more pleased as an organization to feel there's a true management of this park finally. We feel comfortable now. I got 18 other people in units that feel more comfortable now. There's a lot of vehicles here every day now, and you, you see them come and they, they get, wow, what is this? It's my salvation for the day to walk through, to sit here now. This is the first time I'm sitting in the trustees' renovation, if you may, and it's, it's great. It's just great. Congratulations, Javon and friends of Mary Cummings Park. The Charles Elliott Award for Conservationists of the Year has been given since 1934 to individuals or groups who have spent lifetimes dedicating themselves to conservation and the preservation for the betterment of their communities. It is named for our founder, Charles Elliott, who was a visionary and an advocate for preservation. The award has been given by the trustees to the National Park Service, John D. Rockefeller, Governor Deval Patrick, and last year's honoree, Ted Ladd. The Crocker family has worked for generations to protect their family farm, the agricultural landscape, ecological values, and the property streams and waterways that feed Fitchburg's drinking water supply. I am pleased to present to you our 2020 Charles Elliott Conservationist of the Year, the Crocker family. The farm is really a unique and beautiful place that those of us who are from the area have known about for a long time. It is, from the land conservation point of view, one of the properties we would want to see conserved if, if we couldn't do anything else. Being agriculture, being forest, being water supply, and being part of the thousands of acres around, it needed to be conserved. My name's Alfred Crocker. Um, Gus Crocker's my brother, and we grew up on this farm. I'm Gus Crocker. I was the um, owner of this farm, and uh, trustees uh, were the people that I sold it to. My name is Janet Morrison. I'm a professional land conservation consultant working in the area. They have done a wonderful thing here in conserving their farm. It's been in their family for over 100 years. They respect that history. They understand how important it is to the region. Alfred's lived here all of his life. He knows every inch of this farm. We were one of two farming families in Ashby. Pretty isolated. Didn't have any kids within three or four miles, I guess, of Playwood. So we'd do morning chores and then go to school. We'd get home and do chores. Pretty much an idyllic lifestyle. It was a great, great way to grow up. My passion for conservation came through my mother, Ruthie. My father was the agriculturalist. My mother was the conservationist, preservationist. After my father passed away, we always kept this place as a uh, informal wildlife sanctuary, which always made my mom feel real good. When we reach a certain age and it becomes important to figure out who's the next, next steward of the land, we were just pleased as punch that the trustees stepped up and we could make it happen. This land is such a integral part 
of a big puzzle. It's a major wildlife corridor. It connects to this really large open space area that goes from downtown Fitchburg pretty much almost up to the New Hampshire border. And there is this medium high elevation of 1,000, 1,200 feet. It's a beautiful piece of farmland, and farmland, of course, is, is at risk all around this area for development, residential development. Talking with Janet Morrison, who's just a wealth of knowledge on conservation, Janet really made us aware of the importance of not having 200 acres here and 200 acres there with housing in between. I mean, the animals need the big piece of land. The fact that it does abut Fitchburg's water supply has to be a good thing. It included a tributary to the Fitchburg Reservoir and Ashby, which is the key reservoir in Fitchburg system in this area. We conserved it through the state drinking water supply protection grant. The rest of the habitat, the forest land, the wetlands, the streams are just beautiful. There's lots of wonderful stone walls, the Jewel Hill, of course, with its view of Boston. My favorite place on the land is probably the overlook of the ledges, as we call them. Pretty peaceful spot. My father let people use this farm as they so desired, and they came here if somebody wanted to go for a walk or ride a horse. Or, so I guess it kind of came naturally to me to let the public use it. The land should be available to people that want to get out and see it and appreciate it. And again, that's where the trustees seem to fit in perfectly with our plans for the land. The Elliott Award is well-deserved by Gus and Alfred Crocker. I don't think it is ever easy for a family to conserve a property of this size. They deserve a tremendous amount of credit for waiting and being very patient until they understood what they needed to do and wanted to do. And I hope it inspires other landowners to, to think in that way. It's nice to be recognized for doing this. The trustees have been uh, fabulous to work with. It feels good, it feels right. I think we all appreciate you acknowledging the fact that this is done. I think my mom would be happy that it was conserved. I think she'd be very happy. I want to share some news with you about our trustees president, Barbara Erickson. As most of you know, Barbara has been facing some challenging health issues. Recently, her condition has become more serious and she needs to take more time to focus on her personal health. Going forward, Jocelyn Forbush will serve as interim president and CEO. I speak on behalf of the board of directors when I say, we have the utmost confidence in Jocelyn's leadership and that of the executive team. I also want to assure you that the board and the leadership of the organization remain dedicated to fulfilling the five major goals of the strategic plan, as you will hear throughout tonight's program. Finally, I want to express the board's most sincere gratitude to all of you for all of your incredible support during a very challenging time. I know Barbara has the greatest gratitude for all of you, and I know we all send her our warmest thoughts and prayers. Thank you. Good evening. When we were all together last year, we couldn't have anticipated what 2020 had in store for us. We've always known that the work the trustees does is important, but never have our properties been more valued by our members and our neighbors. They took solace in nature whenever they could, and we invited many newcomers to the organization who just needed to get out of their homes to enjoy the outdoors. We followed government advisories and protocols and made the difficult but necessary decision to close every property for a short time in the spring. We canceled all public in-person events through June. We worked hard throughout that time to get our farms ready and give people the safe option of ordering online with contactless pickup. 
our team became even more creative and provided new virtual programming and ways to visit the property without leaving the safety of home. We are extremely grateful for the generosity of our members and donors over the last 125 years who have given us a strong organizational foundation. While peer organizations had to furlough or lay off staff, we did not and were able to keep moving many important projects ahead. We reopened our property slowly with new health and safety precautions in place to control overcrowding. We went to an online ticketing system at 13 of our gated locations, including Namkeg, De Cordova, Fruitlands, World's End, and Cranes Beach. In many locations, we saw record numbers of visitors as people flocked to our special places. This year, we reached the halfway mark through our strategic plan, Momentum, and I'm pleased to share some of our great progress towards our goals. We continued to secure new reservations around the state, working to protect the places people love, the first goal in our strategic plan. We completed site clearing and stewardship work at the Brickyard, so we were able to open up this Menemsha gem to the public this spring officially. This trustee's site has some of the most significant archeological resources on the vineyard. So we're very pleased to make it safe to welcome the public for the first time. We finished extensive work throughout the 216 acre Mary Cummings Park in Woburn and Burlington, including at the entrances, parking areas, and in the creation of the new Millipore Sigma Boardwalk. From this new boardwalk, Visitors will learn all about the ecology of the site, including marshland. We hope you will all join us for a public celebration of the trustees' management of this important site in the spring. And of course, earlier tonight, you heard quite a bit about Jewel Hill in Ashburnham, which we officially acquired in the spring. This was made possible through a bargain sale from the Crocker family and a large bequest through Semper Verens Society member, Jamie Hudson. It's a stunning property that we hope everyone will visit, explore, and enjoy. This year, we took a big step towards our goal of creating a network of signature parks around Boston's vulnerable harbor under our One Waterfront initiative. In July, we received official designation from the Massachusetts Port Authority as the site developer for a new waterfront park in East Boston. Today, Pierce Park 3 is an abandoned pier, but that will soon change. We look forward to sharing more about this work soon. The trustees has often wanted to protect more places on Cape Cod. We recently had the opportunity to begin discussions on the addition of Armstrong Kelly Park in Osterville. The Cape Cod Horticultural Society is integrating into the trustees so this beautiful eight and a half acre garden and woodland oasis that is treasured by the community will be protected forever. We are in the midst of a two and a half million dollar fundraising campaign and I look forward to sharing our progress. Our public policy efforts were instrumental in the House and Senate, passing key climate bills under the state's Global Warming Solutions Act and we were active in supporting climate resilience language for the House and Senate's Economic Recovery Partnership for Growth legislation. We also worked to persuade the state to improve the Solar Massachusetts Renewable Target Program to protect sensitive habitats from solar development projects. The second goal of our strategic plan focuses on how we respond to a changing coast. We are addressing key property vulnerabilities through an array of solutions and trials of leading edge techniques. And we share these findings and information with colleagues and the broader public. The trustees leadership can make a real impact on the dramatically changing coast due to climate change. Our first State of the Coast report was the culmination of a year of compiling research from many sources focused on sea level rise and storm surge impacts affecting 13 coastal zone communities on the North Shore. The report features trustees projects as well as strategies and actions of the communities that show what is being done today. A few weeks before the State of the Coast was announced, 
we launched a comprehensive communication initiative online. Titled A Focus on Our Most Vulnerable Places, we used three of our properties as case studies to explore opportunities and benefits of nature-based resilience interventions for barrier beaches like Norton Point, coastal banks like Waysque, and publicly accessible shorelines like Crane Beach. We created several multimedia experiences that showcase these beautiful properties, highlight stakeholder perspectives on coastal change, and focus on coastal issues and climate adaptation. There is also a stunning 360-degree panorama video tour. In partnership with the Town of Ipswich and funded by a Coastal Resilience Grant from the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management, the trustees has been working to bolster the resilience of Argilla Road to increased flooding events as we protect the only access point here to the Crane Estate and Crane Beach for residents, fishermen, clamors, and visitors. Nearby in the Great Marsh, we are working to repair the effects of historic ditching that have compromised natural draining processes. We are using an innovative nature-based method of ditch remediation that will ultimately fortify 330 acres of the marsh in Newberry, Essex, and Ipswich. As we work to elevate our cultural and agricultural experiences, the public garden transformations at both Stevens Coolidge Place and Long Hill continue to move forward. At Stevens Coolidge Place, we're constructing a new entrance, parking area, and gateway center designed by architect Mary Ann Thompson. Our garden plans, based on Mick Young Kim design concepts, are now complete and are being implemented this fall, including the planting of 165,000 bulbs in preparation for a spectacular spring. At our Long Hill property, we are rejuvenating the historic Sedgwick Gardens. Much needed clearing was done to open up the original views again, and we're working on designs for the new garden area at the top of the hill. In the meantime, we are restoring hand-painted Chinese wallpaper that was brought to the home in late 1920s by Ellery Sedgwick and his first wife, Mabel. These gardens will be flagship sites for teaching about horticulture. We are telling more of the stories of those who lived at trustees' places. We created a virtual tour of the Colonel John Ashley House about the legacy of Elizabeth Freeman, that follows her life as an enslaved person here in Massachusetts and her brave and successful effort to sue for her own freedom, becoming the first person to do so, and her later life as a valued member of the Stockbridge community. In this holiday season, we will publish our first Castle Hill guidebook, a beautifully illustrated and written commemorative book about the history of the Crane Estate and the beauty of Castle Hill. Produced by Scala Publishers, the new book will be available online and makes a great gift for anyone who loves Castle Hill. Presenting our cultural history is one way to create a sense of welcome at our properties. Another is to expand our portfolio of family and young adult experiences available for all seasons. We want to invite the next generation outside to cultivate those who will be our replacements with our important work. Last fiscal year, we welcomed nearly 400,000 people to public programs. This year, we created a combination of virtual and in-person programs which helped families get outside and fill the education gap caused by COVID. We created new ways to bring people back to our property safely. We sold out each of four nights for the Fresh Air Flicks drive-in movies at Holmes Reservation in Plymouth, date nights and sunset picnics at Namkeg, De Cordova, Appleton, and Fruitlands allowed couples and families to enjoy the serenity and beauty of our properties. Meanwhile, camping at Tully Lake Campground had its strongest year to date, and Rocky Woods opened new sites 
with an enhanced experience thanks to our friends at REI. Providing safe outdoor experiences for our members and guests was more needed this year than ever before. Summer camps were only partially interrupted as we figured out how to safely hold camp at four of our sites, Appleton, Weir River, Powisset, and Summer Quest at Castle Hill were all in person, while Hive at De Cordoba was a virtual camp. We had more than 1,100 kids who were able to hike the trails, discover new things in nature, make friends, create works of art, play new socially distant games, and simply have fun. Appleton Farm Camp was even extended two weeks to help parents when schools announced a later start to the school year. Soon we will introduce a COVID safe holiday winter lights festival throughout the months of November and December. This year, we hope to see you all for a little bit of wonder at the Bradley Estate in Canton or Namkeg in Stockbridge. We must always plan for a sustainable organization and continue to build a foundation for the trustees of the future. We are moving our organization forward and growing our base of support. The first point of contact for many of our visitors is our website. This summer, we launched a redesigned site that has larger imagery, new video, shareable pages, and all content is mobile friendly. We've had over 100% growth in site traffic and our search rate is up over 2000%. The more engaging people find a site, the more apt they are to follow through with their actions, whether that's to visit, join a program, or become a member. One of the reasons we've been able to focus on the future is that our membership numbers have consistently exceeded our goals. With a 7% growth last year, and this year we're tracking at 20% above last year at the same time. This vital support helps the organization achieve our mission every year. Thank you all for your membership. We are grateful that so many individuals and families discovered the health and wellness benefits of the trustees' special places and have embraced the incredible value of a trustees' membership. We continue to make investments in the communities around our sites. This summer, we hired our first managing director of Community Impact. She has already been leading a process to better articulate our commitment to diversity, belonging, inclusion, and equity. These efforts are centered on creating inclusive places of belonging for our staff, members, visitors, and communities across all properties. And we're committed to this work both internally and externally. I am thrilled to tell you that we are 86% of the way to our original momentum campaign goal of $96 million. We appreciate your support in reaching this incredible number by the midpoint of the strategic plan. With the site designation at Pierce Park, however, we now need to add $30 million, raising our target to $126 million. We know this is a huge undertaking, but with your support, we know we'll get there and we are well on our way. Yes, we are facing unprecedented challenges, but we are also facing an unprecedented opportunity to introduce the trustees to more people. There is an increased demand to get outside, to get out of our houses and to find safe but constructive ways for us to be together with our families and friends. We are offering visitors, members, and newcomers something they vitally need. Connection. Connection to nature, to one another, and to the purpose of saving places. We have risen to the occasion, but we have more to do, and we can only do that work together. We are all in this together, and together we are strong. To close this annual meeting, it is now my pleasure to introduce to you the Trustees Executive Vice President, Jocelyn Forbush.
Greetings from the Eleanor Cabot Bradley Estate and welcome to the 129th Annual Meeting. Congratulations to the award recipients and the new members of governance. I'm Jocelyn Forbush, Executive Vice President of the Trustees, and I'm pleased to deliver the President's remarks. Before I begin, I want to pause to remember several good friends who we lost this year. And now I'd like to recognize a few of them. Bill Farkas was a longtime friend to the trustees. While Bill lived in Pennsylvania, he loved the Berkshires in Massachusetts and spent a great deal of time there throughout his life. Many of you knew Bill or met him at the Nomkeg Garden Party. He was an incredibly kind and friendly man who was deeply committed to our work, especially land conservation in the Berkshires and his beloved Monument Mountain. Bill so deeply loved the trustees that he left a bequest, which we believe is the largest non-land bequest in our history. We thank him for his incredible generosity. Also to Vidian, our neighbor at Nomkeg was also a supporter and friend. Also supported our work, including our new signature events and landscape projects. Thank you, Asso, for your longtime dedication to the Berkshires and to Nomkeg. Peter Spang had been a member of the trustees for more than 40 years and became a corporate trustee in 1982. He was a member of the Chairman's Council and a dedicated founding member of the Cultural Resources Committee. Peter brought his knowledge and expertise in decorative arts to the trustees as a generous and guiding leader in advocating and caring for our cultural resources. Now I'd like to ask for a moment of silence to remember those we have lost. This year has been one of loss in other ways. Tonight, I want to talk about that loss and specifically how, together, we develop a strategy of recovery, rejuvenation, and resiliency for the trustees. In some way or another, we've all had to deal with some form of loss in the last year. We've lost our sense of normalcy and the stability of routine. Our children have lost parts of their educational experiences. An entire class of students have lost the opportunity to go to prom or walk across the stage for graduation. Others have postponed their weddings or resolved to have them with just a few friends and family. And many others have experienced much deeper and more profound losses. We are living through a global pandemic, a financial crisis, and a socially divided and politically charged time. How will we endure and find healing? How can we ensure that as an organization with 130 years of history and tradition, that we endure for another 130? How do we amplify our relevance at a time when so many are distracted by the task of living? It has become clear to many of us that there's no going back, that the way of living before the pandemic has been lost. And tonight, I would like to take a brief moment to look back and then look deeply and thoughtfully forward at the future, a future that we can build together. It has become almost tiresome to say that we are living in unprecedented times. It has also become clear that such times require unprecedented thinking. We can't talk about loss without also talking about the other side, the return of normalcy, the healing, and the gratitude for what endures. Loss amplifies our present. Earlier in the year, when we saw that the world changed almost overnight and that the offer of trustees would be in high demand, we pivoted almost every business model that we have. We changed the way we work in order to fulfill our mission. A 130-year-old organization like ours may seem to run on tradition rather than transformation, but actually, it is in our DNA to drive radical new thinking and to generate new ways of working when crisis hits. In fact, there are more than a few examples of how the trustees has responded to crisis, 
with bold new ideas and major shifts in our work and approach. Our very founding was a response to the public health crisis of the late 19th century and the industrialization of the city, leading Charles Eliot to deem open and natural spaces as a salve for both the body and the mind, launching a movement. Following the financial depression of 1924, the trustees, along with 10 other private groups, including Appalachian Mountain Club, Mass Audubon, and the Society for Preservation of New England Antiquities, organized and launched the landmark conference called The Needs and Uses of Open Spaces. This conference would lead to the 1929 report on open spaces that would bring action and attention to the most critical needs of the time. Eventually, every site the report had identified would be protected by a federal, state, or private entity. Prompted by the awareness of the environmental crisis of the 1960s, the trustees created a new category of property protection. We designated respective properties with the title of wildlife refuge or preserve for the first time. During this period, we protected Cascada Cotu Wildlife Refuge on Nantucket and Brooks Woodland Preserve in Petersham, and a few years later, the Long Point Wildlife Refuge. All places that protect wildlife and flora provide essential habitat and expand our mission work. And think of the 1970s, the oil crisis, the Nixon scandal, and emergence of industrial global competition. During this tumultuous time, the trustees was busy still, this time creating the conservation restriction program that we know today. Our first CR protected 81 acres in Sherbourne. Since then, we've become the largest private holder of CRs in Massachusetts, protecting over 21,000 acres. Only a decade later, in the early 1980s, a massive real estate boom and another financial crisis would push us to shift our work again. The trustees, along with other organizations, was part of founding the National Land Trust Alliance, a forum for advancing land conservation on a national level. There are many other examples of how the trustees has been present, active, and at the forefront of leading during many crises. We can look to American business for examples of how innovation has flourished in response to crisis. The launch of Microsoft and personal computing in the midst of the economic downturn of the 1970s. The creation and reveal of the iPhone. The rise of Airbnb, Uber, and Venmo, which supported our lifestyle changes coming out of the Great Recession of 2008. What can we learn from these examples? They are important reminders of what it means to be resilient of not only bouncing back from disruption, but bouncing back better and stronger than before. The trustees has done this time and time again as our organization evolved, not despite the challenges we have faced, but through them, perhaps even because of them. We have our own examples at the trustees. In 1975, our annual report noted a significant increase in gifts and membership contributions and the addition of some 2,000 acres of land to our portfolio in spite of continuing economic pressures nationally and a greater demand for the charitable dollar. The early 90s found us celebrating the centennial of our founding and despite an economic downturn leading to a shortfall in revenues, was the year when we went public with a media campaign that resulted in dramatic membership growth. In 2002, we reflected on the previous year of unprecedented challenges with events threatening to eclipse all other concerns, but noted the enduring importance of our mission was evident in the fall of 2001 as people sought solace and tranquility in our open meadows, our forested paths, and formal gardens. Sentiments that hold true today. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic this spring, we faced the difficult challenge of having to temporarily close our properties, a decision that was hard for all of us. Among the hundreds of letters and emails we received in response to these temporary closures, one letter from a 30-year member noted that his family had spent every year visiting and walking on Crane Beach, raising their kids, and growing as a family with this tradition. In the midst of this crisis, it was heartwarming to be reminded that we were an important part of people's healing, 
and that our mission was already embedded in so many lives. As you heard earlier, we continue to protect places that people love, the places that are iconic and will become part of the fabric of our communities in perpetuity, places like Jewel Hill and Mary Cummings Park. And soon, we hope, Armstrong Kelly Park, an eight and a half acre garden and park in Osterville Village on Cape Cod. This site has been lovingly cared for by a group of volunteers for many years, and we're now in the process of protecting this oasis through an integration with the Cape Cod Horticultural Society. And even in this moment, the protection of many other places is underway, places we will share when they are ready. Since COVID was first discovered in Wuhan, China, we have witnessed a transformation to the planet, including some unexpected positive impacts for our climate due to the near shutdown of international travel and the lockdown of whole nations. Though this decrease could be temporary without a continuing commitment to better habits, estimates put 2020's decrease in carbon emissions, even conservatively, as the largest one-year drop since World War II. We are pleased that we are doing our own work to ensure that climate change continues to be a civic dialogue. We're currently working on the second edition of our State of the Coast report, which will focus on Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, and Cape Cod in 2021. We look forward to engaging the community of Boston in designing an exciting waterfront park that will buffer future storm surge and sea level rise. And with our advocacy support for statewide greenhouse gas emission limits by 2050, in addition to our own stewardship interventions along the coast, we will continue to advance our climate adaptation agenda. We were also pleased to see that as a response to COVID, there's been a return to cooking from scratch and especially sourcing groceries from farms like ours. As millions of people sheltered in place, a recent study reported that 54% of Americans are cooking more than before the pandemic, according to a study done by Hunter, a food and beverage firm. In response to this increased desire from members and Massachusetts residents to access healthy local food, we expanded our farm operations last spring, and this enhanced access has been met with enthusiasm. Our CSAs have reached more families than ever before, as has our mobile market, which is reaching deeper into underserved communities of Metro Boston, addressing food security for hundreds of families. Our new online ordering and contactless pickup food services were implemented as early as March, when grocery aisles were empty and we were all thinking we'd be back at work in a week or so. We continue to expand and improve our agricultural operations on our community farms. Complementing this work, we are also expanding how we use our farms to educate our visitors, especially those at summer camp and family programs. Next season, we'll be launching new food and agricultural curriculums intended to cultivate healthy minds and bodies and build a connection to the land for the next generation. And in our own backyards across the country, we've seen a resurgence of victory gardens. According to global market data, gardening was the second most popular lockdown activity after watching TV. Online seed and bulb companies saw triple and quadruple sales figures. Horticultural sites were slammed with questions about composting, window gardens, herb choices, and flowers, flowers, flowers. Luckily, Gardens are something that the trustees knows a little bit about. Our 56 community gardens have been at maximum enrollment, providing sustenance and beauty for so many gardeners and their families. Meanwhile, two of our most significant garden properties are undergoing a multi-year transformation. At Stevens Coolidge Place in North Andover, we resumed construction on our new Garden Gateway Center and an extensive garden expansion. Next spring, join us for a grand opening of these new gardens just in time for a signature spring spectacular with 165,000 flowering bulbs. And in the following year, we look forward to unveiling transformative horticultural work at Long Hill in Beverly, including creating access to the historic house that has not been open to the public for decades. Even though we were able to open up the grounds of our cultural sites in the summer, just this month we welcomed visitors back to enjoy art in the galleries of De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum and Fruitlands Museum.
As we look ahead, the future of art at the trustees is bright. De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum is preparing to present two important exhibitions next year by artists participating in the national dialogue about race. Sonia Clark and Jeffrey Gibson will each lead us into discussion of race and remembrance through their unique installations. In addition, we look forward to unveiling a new art and landscape project that we will be announcing soon. Next year will be filled with art. In response to social distancing, isolation, and quarantine measures, we've seen a resurgence in appreciation for what has made our organization great and relevant throughout the decades, getting outdoors and enjoying public open space. In fact, 15% more Americans plan to hike than usual due to COVID-19, according to the Outdoor Recreation Association. Our summer visitation numbers have been at record highs as we've seen our trails, beaches, mountains, and meadows filled with visitors seeking to get outside safely. We have also seen a 30% increase in membership, a phenomenal endorsement of the trustees' mission. Opting out of hotels and planes, Americans fell in love with camping this summer. Camping services report a 400% increase, while our partner, REI, reported the tents, sleeping bags, and camping furniture were selling at record pace. Once we opened up our beloved Tully Lake campground, we experienced 90% occupancy and have extended our season further into the fall in order to meet demand. In time for next spring, we plan to offer new ways to camp with trustees, giving our current campgrounds a fresh update with new options and offering campout programs at some of the most coveted spots in the state. We can't wait to invite you out under the stars. Going forward over the remaining two years of our strategic plan, Expect to see us push hard to get more people outside in creative ways. From nature and adventure play spaces to new family hiking guides and recreational opportunities like camping, kayaking, and biking, we plan to bring more ways for you to experience the trustees. As I record this message, the fall leaves are brilliantly entertaining. I am reminded that even in a pandemic, nature endures, seasons change. Life goes on even when it is forever altered. And so I return to the question I posed at the start. How do we amplify our relevance during these socially divided and politically charged times to move beyond the crisis? Through a global pandemic and a financial crisis, how will we find healing and ensure that the trustees endures for another 130 years? While there are still many unknowns about what lies ahead, one thing I do know, looking back on our history as an organization and on what we've achieved in 2020 thus far, is that we will face it together and we will come out better than we were before. Behind all of the work are the people, real trustees who are meeting the challenge of the hardest year in modern history. It's all about all of you, our members, supporters, volunteers, neighbors, colleagues, and friends. It is thanks to you that our work is even more relevant than ever, and we believe our momentum will not be interrupted by the challenges we face today. As we've learned from those before us, we must rise to the occasion. The goals of our strategic plan still resonate and are, in some cases, amplified by our changing world. And so, again, faced with a new world, we will move forward. But in 2020 and beyond, moving forward comes with an increased commitment and urgency to do so in a way that ensures our spaces are welcoming for people of all backgrounds to access and enjoy. As such, we've accelerated areas of work like our diversity and inclusion efforts to an even higher priority. We must continue to preserve and protect, not just for some, but for all. Today, that distinction is more important than ever. Please join us as together, we move through, forward, and beyond the challenges of today to invite, elevate, protect, respond, and build the trustees of the future. We can't do it alone. We never have. We are all in this together. 
Thank you.